Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Karan, and uh, geopolitics and investing is is uh, is not what you typically expect from a mutual fund guy to sell. My job is to sell mutual funds, look at the investment world, come out, come out and tell you when to buy, when to sell. But over the last few years, uh, my interests in fields outside of managing money have led me to a discovery around the world of geopolitics and and. In some ways, I call this the country first presentation. I mean, the title of my presentation is country first. And the reason why I say that is, uh, if, if you're not careful about what's happening in the country, then your business and my business and what we do in the market, everything actually becomes irrelevant. Just think about it. Uh, independence just been about 70 years now. Prior to that, we've been under the British rule. And prior to that, we've been part of the Mughal Empire. This independence is literally 70 years old only. And to that extent, I don't want to actually create any fear here today. I don't want to share anything which is uh, political. Uh, but I want you to be aware of certain things that are going on right under our noses. So, Jobi I will share karunga. First of all, I'll need some more attention. I'll, have, I'll need you to focus because I'm going to go into the world of maps, into the world of geography, into the world of uh, like the gentleman mentioned, geopolitics. And somewhere at the end of it, what I promise to do is get it back to the world of investing. There is a link, there is a correlation. But first, and certainly right at the back, I need some assurance that you will the slides pe dhyan doge because it will require a lot of attention on these maps. Is that okay with all of you? Okay, parts of this discussion can get sensitive. So please don't mind, I'm not taking any sides. I'm sharing with you everything which is in the public domain. Uh, it's on Google, you can go and check it out. Um, not sure if my videos are working. You know, I want you to do one thing before I start. I actually want you to stand up because I want to play the national anthem to begin with. And if you don't mind, if I can get to play, this is a very special national anthem. It was shot at Siachen. You should just have a look at this. real footage, everyone is a soldier. The team which went there had to spend four days at Siachen in minus 52 degrees to shoot the, to shoot this. They came back rattled, they couldn't handle it. Uh, I know this because the person who made the video shared that with us. Uh, minus 52 degrees, that's where our soldiers uh, operate out from. And for a stretch of land called Siachen Glacier, where no one is ever going to grow anything, for sure. Uh, like I promised you, I'll take you into the world of maps. Uh, starting with uh, the country's map. It's, 
it's actually the political map of India, which is what I've, you know, I've been taught over the years when I was a kid. My sister is here today, even she must have been shown this map. Uh, you know, we've all grown up on this map. I want to take you to, this is where we are today, Delhi, out here. I've just flown in from Bombay, did this. Uh, many times, you know, when we have foreign partners, our JV partners come from, the, fr come from all over the world and I, and I show them the map, I tell them this is not a country. First of all, this is not a country. We are a, we are a continent. We are called the Indian subcontinent. That's how Vishal this desh is. And as you travel across the country, one of the things you'll notice is its diversity, which everyone knows about. Uh, to point out the diversity, I just want to know, has anyone been to the Northeast? Uh, seven Sisters, uh, Northeast, fascinating area. As you go up, you obviously come to Punjab and out here. Has anyone been to Srinagar, Kashmir, Jammu, parts of Jammu? Has anyone been to, can you on the map point out where Siachen is? Upper portion right, upper portion middle, right in the center. Or where Kargil is? Okay, so we'll do a little bit of deep dive into parts of that. But before that, I want to also show you, there is, we've got two neighbors, uh, not very friendly to us. One is Pakistan, which is on the western, uh, which is the western border for us. And on the eastern borders, we have China. Uh, like I said, not a very friendly neighborhood. Uh, we fought, how many wars do you think we fought since independence with this set of two people? Four actually. Depends, depends on how you treat Kargil. Depends on how you treat Kargil. 62, 65, 71, Kargil, uh, which were, starts with 48, starts with 48. So we've been at war now, we've been at war. And then there is this land called Jammu and Kashmir, where we seem to be fighting a war every day. And like I said, I'll, I'll take you into that world a little bit more. Uh, this is Jammu and Kashmir uh, out here. Has anyone been to Pakistan? Ever? Do you have friends from Pakistan? You've been to Pakistan? Yeah. Which, which part of Pakistan have you been to? Lahore. Lahore. Lovely place. It's almost like going to La Delhi, closest. It's much more beautiful. So Lahore. Uh, I just want you to just spend some time. I'll, I'll quickly take you all through Pakistan. I'll start with the main parts of Pakistan. Actually, this is Punjab. This is the Pakistani Punjab. That's the heartland of Pakistan. That's where the majority of politicians, the majority of the army comes from the Punjab. Uh, and this is Sindh. And up there is Islamabad. And I, at some stage, please focus on this purple patch. We'll come back to this purple patch, which they call as the Northwest Frontier. But for now, I also want to get you to focus on this yellow patch. It's a pretty big patch. Off late, you must have heard PM Modi speak about a place called Balochistan. Uh, it's a bit of a troubled area within Pakistan. And we're going to talk a lot about parts of Balochistan and parts of the purple area. Balochistan what, doesn't, doesn't take it as part of Pakistan. They don't. They don't. But we'll, we'll get there. So we'll get there. So this is Balochistan. By the way, for everyone sitting out here, Balochistan actually shares its own borders with Iran, and parts of it with Afghanistan. So now we're getting into spaces which is around the Middle East. Uh, so this is what Pakistan looks like. Like I said, please come back to this purple patch because that, ye upar wala purple patch, ye wala, this one, has some resemblance to, to this purple patch. They look similar. Just think about this. You, Hamara wala purple patch and ye wala purple. They are same because both the countries show that as parts of their own maps. And which is known as the Pakistan occupied Kashmir and the disputed areas, etc. Uh, but let's go further. What if I just deconstruct Jammu and Kashmir further for you? This is what it really looks like. So for everyone who believes that the Indian map is like this, it's actually not true. 
it's not true. So this whole map that we have shown over the last 70 years is not necessarily true. The green actually is not ours or taken away. It's what we call as Pakistan occupied Kashmir. This entire green, uh, the white bit is what we really control. So actually, really, really, if you, if you really want to see what is with us, so you look at the map of India, look, take this away, this is what we look like. And by the way, that's not all. There is this red part in, I think, in the 60s, it was given away to the Chinese. It was given away. And, uh, oh yeah, it was in 63. So, uh, please don't think, why am I giving you a geography and history lesson? At some stage, I will come and try my best to tie the knots, or at least to untie the knots. Uh, that we keep hearing about Jammu and Kashmir and its implications on India and eventually on you as investors because it has an implication on the markets as well. So this is what actually Jammu and Kashmir looks like. Our other neighbor, China, has been in Tibet for as long as we can remember. And a part of it is called Aksai Chin. Now I will come back to explaining why am I showing you all this? Just for now, just, just get an idea that parts of what you see in our map are not ours. On the green side is Pakistan occupied Kashmir. There's this red line, red area that's been given to China. And on the other side, there is Aksai Chin, which has direct access into Tibet. Okay, we leave it here for now. Has anyone been to China? Good. Beijing, Shanghai. Shenzhen. There's one thing very, very interesting about China, and this map doesn't depict it very well. I found another map, which I found on Google. There's something very interesting about the Chinese territory, unlike ours. What you'd see is virtually all of China, all of inhabited China, is around its, is around its coast, the South China Sea. And actually, in the middle of China is the Gobi Desert out here. This is all Gobi Desert. And when you come here, it's the Himalayas. So unlike, unlike this country, which is spread all over. So whether I'm in Uttar Pradesh, or if I'm in Rajasthan, or Maharashtra, or Tamil Nadu, or Karnataka, or any of the northeastern states, it's populated. Uh, we do, and yet we have a desert, and yet we have the Himalayas. And, and this um, doesn't have anything in the middle, and its population towards the left-hand side, which is bordering with us, is at best Tibet. So by default, all of China's development has happened around its coastlines, which is the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And how many of you have been hearing about the international arbitration law talking about China's intrusion in the South China Sea. Have you been hearing about that? There's a reason for that. Suddenly, this country doesn't just seem to have not very good relationships with India, but with not very great relationships with Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, Taiwan. That's a lot of countries not to have great relationships with. And they all are part of the South China Sea. So starting from all the way here, powerful country. And it's almost dominating um, seven, eight, maybe nine countries. So much so even the Australians are sometimes feel threatened. And then of course, they share a border with us. So what I'm going to do over the next five, ten minutes, at least on this aspect, is take you into what I think is uh, is the Chinese think tank, what they've worked on in the last 20 years, and actually the title of what they've built, it's called the String of Pearls. I'm going to show you something which will give you an idea. But before that, this is something that you must keep at the back of your mind. If you look at India and invert the map, just think of this, you invert the map, 
can you imagine the amount of ocean that we have to cover protect it's more than the land mass just think about it invert the entire area and we have bigger oceans to protect and cover and there are more sea routes than there are land routes and remember one thing the country which controls sea routes controls everything so anyway i'm going to take you into take you into what is actually the string of pearls uh this is this started in early 95 this is about 20 years ago when the chinese started to put naval bases across and by the way all of this is on google not made by me not by my amc so all on google it's very basic you can just do a search on string of pearls you'll get everything so the chinese started creating naval bases and every star you see star 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 is a naval base is a chinese naval base now why would some country want to create naval bases as far as out as far out as um africa or for that matter in the middle east it's because you need to dominate the sea lanes if you don't dominate the sea lanes you are not a superpower and if you dominate the sea lanes you dominate trade and to dominate trade you need protection and protection comes from naval forces and what what they call in navy is blue ocean capability you have to have capability to reach out it's not about 2000 km it's not about 3000 it's about 15000 km so i'm going just leaving this just leaving this slide with all of you have a look at it um 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 now they're starting to appear in our land in our waters port player 7 actually they went and created one in bangladesh i'm not sure if you if you read a few days ago uh, just literally two days ago the bangladeshi government has bought two submarines from the chinese it doesn't happen till you don't invest 10 years in that country they've created a base out there 9 right under our noses 10 sri lanka go up gwadar pakistan 11 all the way the only saving grace right now for us is at least we are protecting our coastline can you see the india ka map here i mean can you see the flag that depicts that our our navy is protecting our coastline utna abhi tak samla hua hai so the dominance of the chinese on the south china sea is still not there on the indian ocean that's the one good but building all of this has happened in the last 20 years i want to ask you something have you heard of this before is it something you need to know does it affect your daily lives can it have an impact on the country which parts of it is yes and which parts of it are no all of it is either yes no or maybe all of it is yes so my question is that if it is such if it is critical or if it is important why is it not why is it not there think about it i mean it's been happening for 20 years these things don't happen overnight you have to invest in it and why is it that we've got all of this coming up right under our noses encircling and remember i am not war mongering out here i am not scaring you i am giving you hard facts they're all in google as basic as google they're not even you don't even have to do a detailed dive you'll get it but something is happening of which some day we'll hear a bit more and the reason for that is trade at the end of it you're all businessmen or you're all professionals at the end of it it's all economics and i will show you what i'm trying to say out here at the end of it it's all investments and return on investments it looks as if there is um power games going on but everything is mathematically economics let me show you what i mean this is the sea route i just showed you and on top the chinese have built what is known as one belt one road there's a road there's a highway which starts from beijing all the way into turkey so you have 
two, basically you have two routes. The Silk Route has actually been recreated. So you've got a highway from Beijing to Turkey, you can drive through, or you can take the sea route. And it's not easy creating these highways. They're, they're tough to build, because they go over some very tough terrain. Part of that terrain is over our heads. And now, now you'll start hearing words like Gilgit Baltistan. Aapne recently suna hai? A, a place somewhere up in the hills, Jammu and Kashmir, Gilgit Baltistan. I'll try and show you part where it's part of POK. And let's see. Let me just explain what I was trying to tell you of sea routes. Basically, this is how trade travels. All of Chinese sea lanes, that's how trade travels. So if they need oil, China is the largest importer of oil. I mean, they just consume oil. They consume oil iron, they consume coal. The red line denotes the sea lanes. That's how it travels. Okay? And there's this green line, which is the road. So I'm going to show you what the impact of creating this versus this is. Don't get uh, super awed by these slides. My last point on this is, imagine this journey of oil. It starts from a port here, and the tanker has to come all the way from Kuwait on to this port. This is the route. This is the tanker. It's 13,000 kilometers of travel by sea route. It's 13,000 kilometers. It's a sea route. Okay. It just more importantly, it passes through these very, very disputed seas. But what the Chinese have gone and done is that they've created a highway and a port in Pakistan called Gwadar. What they've gone and done is created it right here. Starts from here, there's a highway, there's a port. So suddenly, you don't have to travel by sea lanes. You don't have to travel. Here is the oil, comes to Gwadar, comes by road, connects. You know what that has done? The 13,000 kilometers has come down to 2,000 kilometers. Do you get the impact what I'm trying to tell you out here? The sea lanes are 13,000 kilometers. Create a highway. Don't create. It's created. Cut down the travel time from 13,000 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. And what that basically means is, is this. What used to take 45 days this is 45 days of travel, is now down to 10 days. Now tell me, just think about this. Any one of you who has a power, who has a plant, a manufacturing plant, if you crunch travel time by one third, and if you crunch distance by one third, is it of economic benefit to you or not? You're all businessmen and professionals out here. One third, not even half. I mean, it's just cut down by 70%. All this in the last 20 years. Nothing of this is fictional. Everything is ready. Trade has started. The ports have opened. Now, why am I telling you all this? Why am I telling you this? For two re simple reasons. That if I just... Go to the next slide, which is coming back to the Pakistan map. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because Gwadar, the port, happens to be in Balochistan, which someone just men mentioned out here that Baluchis don't consider themselves as par part of Pakistan. The port is in Gwadar, and the highway starts from Gilgit Baltistan, which is actually Indian. Gilgit Baltistan is part of disputed Kashmir, technically Indian. Now I have a basic question. You've put the plant, you've done, you've crunched down the timelines, and suddenly you are told that this land is not yours. I'm sorry. Now what happens to your investment? Issue? Goes for a toss. So what do you do? You keep, you keep ensuring that no one focuses on the question. Because you create 
a parallel structure where all the attention is focused, which is known as the Kashmir issue. But we are missing one point here, sir. Sure. China can also destroy the bomb. They did it. Uh, Still, they work for 20 years. So, so you have to ask yourself why. That may basically means they knew no one will question it. No, many things to think. I'm just, like I said. Yes. Yes, can. So I'll come to that. I'm just leaving a thought. Here is this country which has crunched 13,000 down to 3,000, crunched 45 down to 10 days, and it passes through three of the, three of the most disputed lands, knowingly. And it's a $50 billion investment, by the way. It's a $50 billion investment. It's not about the investment. The Chinese can afford that investment. Think about the returns on that investment. If you crunch everything by 70%, the returns of that $50 billion over the next 10 years is actually $500 billion. They lay, they're not bothered about the 50. It's the crunch in timeline. It's the crunch in distance. It's the $500 billion extra. And for that, anything would be done to keep it secure. And by the way, to your question, they knew about it because there was no other way also. They had to use this. So when you get into it, you realize that there was no, this was, this all, it's all thought through. So the only way to create no, no, no demands is that you keep something else boiling. And that's the real issue around Kashmir. I don't want to get into it, it's ultra sensitive, it can get, get it's, I've lived there for six years, uh, it's a beautiful place, but we just went there back recently, it's changed, it's changed. And, and what I just, what I, what I just keep thinking over the, I mean, over in my head, is how has this been allowed over so many years? And I'm going to leave that thought with you. We can probably over Q&A or later I can try and answer some of this. But this is what, uh, this is what uh, the string of pearls is. This is what's happening right under our noses. It's all trade. But this is not India's number one problem. And I want you to think about this. Uh, whenever PM Modi has gone and spoken, both in India or, 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 or outside, anywhere in the country, go and you do a YouTube search. What will come across is... I'll come back to this, is terrorism. I open challenge. You can do a search on any one of the speeches, domestic or international. Number one issue raised is terrorism. So I'm now going to take you into a really uh, accepted norm in this country. So my first question is, there's, there are about 80, 85 of us in this room. I want, to answer, I want you to answer this very realistically. Are you victims of terror? Think about it. Are you a victim of terror? Personally, officially, whichever way, whichever really. Are you a victim of terror? Yes. You are, are you a victim of terror? Yes. How? Kashmir, Kashmir, but uh, we are in Delhi where uh, the maximum number of transistor bombs exploded. No, I come from Bombay where the number of incidents have been the highest. The amount of money we are spending on the defense forces deployed yes. there for their daily usage, daily. plus even the soft SOPs we are giving to the Kashmiri people. Wherever, wherever. Yeah. I'm just saying whether getting into detail, but by the way, it looks as if it's up north the issue. There's a five-page printout I took the other day, again from Google. There's not a single city in, in our country that has not been attacked. Not a single city. You think of the city, it's, it's been under attack. Not a single city. And by the way, this problem is now 40 years old. You may think this is Kashmir, but please step back. Look at the Punjab problem. We've lived... We've li we're all from Delhi and we've lived through that stage. Uh, and by the way, I'm not even talking Naxal and Moist. I'm talking actual terror. Terror. 
not Maoism, not Naxalism. I'm going to show you some statistics which you should be aware of. Moody's did a research on terror in India. So first question that I have for all of you is in 20 years, how many times we've had terror attacks? What do you think? 20 years. Sorry, how many? Sorry, sir? Every third day. So how much would that become? Every third day. Any other? We've been attacked 6,034 times in 20 years. That's, that's the Moody research. 6,024. 6024. We are the, the fourth largest importers of terror. Forget importing some good stuff, but we are the, we are the fourth largest importers of terror. And who is in our company? Iraq, Pakistan, Sudan, and now Syria, and now us. So we are competing in some, with some not great companies. 6,000 times your country has been attacked in 20 years. Now step back another 20. It could be very well have been 12,000 attacks. Now I am going to ask you a question. Again, you all are businessmen, you all have your own properties, you all, are, you all have your own manufacturing units. I can understand someone coming into your place and ransacking it once, twice, thrice, four, ten, twenty, thirty, hundred times. At some stage, will you not put a security camera? Will you allow your, your premises to be attacked 6,024 times? So if you were so concerned about terror being your direct victims, why haven't you done something about it till now? now they're not doing anything. Sorry? Demonetization is going to break the back of terrorism. And we'll come to that. For that, we need to recognize. But still, but still our leadership says that it is, it is bad. It's the leadership. So, like, I, we'll come back to that in some way or the other. But I'm just leaving this thought. And again, this is not made by me. I haven't created this report. It's a Moody's report. 6,000 attacks. It's not easy to do that. 50% of all global terror attacks now happen in India. 50%. That's some serious statistic. And I'm going to take you and for some of the kids out here who may not know this, but some photographs out here. It started with, we had our own 9-11. Started with Kanishka. 326 guys. This aircraft took off from Canada, bombed out of the air. This is part of the Punjab problem. It happened in, I think, in 86, 80, I, I forget, I'm sorry, I forget. 86, perhaps. Um, 93, Bombay. Everyone knows about this. And this is one event which happened which only one person lost his life. A passenger lost, only one. To my mind, this has been the biggest attack on this country because we gave away three of the worst criminals that till date operate against this country. Bombay, Bombay, Pathan Court. And by the way, my slides are at least 12 months old. So I mean, at least 10 months old. I can keep adding. Uri. So there's something going on. In the interest of time, I'm now just going to speed up a little bit. I'm going to ask you direct questions. What did you vote against in 2014? Generally. Corruption. Corruption. The graph, corruption, ye wo, ye wo. If you've been attacked 6,000 times, was, was this on your list? In 2014, was this on your list? Why? Lack of awareness. So, um, let's just spend quickly two minutes. This is what is happening now. And again, I'm not pro-BJP, nor am I anti-Congress. I'm putting down hard facts. And again, this is 10 months old. I haven't updated my slides. There's stuff that is beginning to happen. GST is actually not written here. I haven't even written GST here. There's some stuff happening. Good, bad, ugly, I don't know. Whether demonetization helps, we can get into economic details. And There's some stuff beginning to happen. Whatever. Like I said, I don't know good or bad. We'll figure it out. But do you hear about national security and terrorism now? Yes. More. Is that a affirmative yes or a mid? Yes, yes. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. If you haven't heard about that in 70 years, you hear about it now, it's because for now, it seems as if the present government is saying, Abbas. And hear me carefully on this. When you say Abbas, you're actually questioning a lot of money movement. 
a lot of money movement because when you start saying a bus then you are saying 6000 times more attacks ab nahi come come ka matlab now you will put security camera you will put guards on the premises you will ensure that even if someone was planning to come to you you would go there first so there is something happening where you are beginning to hear about it more and perhaps the government's trying to do tell the world that yaar yeah, i am tired of this and maybe we really are and the reason for that is uh, is very simple it has the biggest economic costs on this country every large attack takes away 1.5% gdp that year now i'm going to tell you something which you should comprehend every attack takes away 1.5% big attack every year and we've been under attack for 20 years everyone's uh, financial advisor out here brijesh can do the math 1.5% 20 years cagr can you imagine the economic costs that's 500 billion dollars of economic loss and to give you some perspective i will try and explain to you this in another way how many of you been to the most romantic city in the world paris where have you been huh you liked it so that's my sister out here she's she said i want to come and listen to you i said okay come you been to paris did you like it did you hear about the terror attacks out there yep. would you now if you want to go back I would you think twice. huh think will twice. you think twice yeah. you will go but you'll think twice mm -hmm. uh, how many of you have been to turkey istanbul under attack now for the last six times would you go back there no but why only five attacks and now here is this couple sitting in somewhere in the us wanting to come to jaipur is country safe what will come up no will you come no you won't come let me ask this question in another way just to give you the perspective of that 500 billion dollars what it really means every person will come and invest or go for tourism or put up anything or go anywhere if it's safe and secure that's the number you would you would put your own house in a safe and secure locality won't you why would you why would you create a house where you know that there could be issues so the number one issue that this country faces is a lack of a secure environment you will not attract money if you are unsecure and what i'm going to just quickly take you through is there is a lot of stuff beginning to happen and by the way like i said these slides are dated i haven't even put the surgical strikes because i've only written till myanmar there is stuff beginning to happen maine yahan myanmar tak hi likha hai cross border main across the pak border maine likha bhi nahi hai the stuff starting to happen like i said let me just come back to why am i telling you all this what does it mean for markets here's my last question if everything is about economics and suddenly you say a bus you're actually stopping flow of money i'm give you i'm going to last thing i'm going to share with you is two stats two stats number one stat just to give an idea of flow of money everyone was aware of, i mean you all saw 2611 in bombay right it played out on our tvs live, live. from the start of from the port in karachi till the docking at the mumbai where the fishermen were that phase and the attack just give me an estimate of what just the pure attack what would have it cost and remember you got seven eight guys loaded with guns machines they've got a boat uh, and i'm not even getting into training for a minute i'm just saying sorry sir Uh, it was about seventy thousand dollars. It's about seventy thousand dollars. How do you get seventy thousand dollars to fund an attack? How do you get it? You got to get you got to get that kind of money. Just the, just the coming, entering, getting out, and it takes at least two years of intense training to do what they did. Where do you fund it from? Parts of it is what you just alluded to, is black money. money that has not accounted for and a lot of it is counterfeit money it's a it's a racket or i mean it's not even a racket it's a business model it is a business model 
and it has to have had support internally. Otherwise, it could not have been possible for decades. And suddenly when you start to say bus, you're actually taking away money. It has serious repercussions. I am from Delhi, now I stay in Bombay. I have this question for only Delhiites, I mean, for Delhiites like you. How, how is it justified that students can, in, in a pretty good university, speak about a convicted terror in a manner that they're almost apologetic? How does that happen? Think about it. You've got to have internal structures which are supportive of this. It is all economics. And the other and the last statistic that I want to leave you with is if it is a 1% loss per annum and then you say bus, no more terror, less terror, and the 1% loss comes down for the next 10 years, not only will you add GST ka 1%, you will add back the non-benefit. Can you imagine the repercussions on, the GD, on, on, this, on this country's economics? Because you're not going to be spending on, uh, on, on, on so many support structures. In my assessment, the number one issue that the government faces is actually terrorism. Because the costs are so high, and yet the biggest cost is we don't realize it. We're at a proxy war and we don't even know it. So my, my last point on this is, um, a one, for anyone who's now putting a plant, and the choices are Gurgaon versus Jharkhand, which could probably be Naxal infested, chances are that you'll put it in Gurgaon. Now imagine someone sitting in New York in a boardroom deciding, yaar, apna next plant where should we put? In Germany or in India? Germany. As long as you do not, if we create a safer and secure environment now, the added, the advantages are so huge because the world does not know where to invest. This is the only country to come and invest. All it needs is a secure environment. And I think the first steps are being taken. So I'm just going to leave you with my last slide, which is my mutual fund slide. As my humble request, I will not tell you what to do because I finished with that part. Just don't focus on the markets. The markets are irrelevant. Focus on your dreams, your plans, share them with Bridgesh and the Bellwether team. Their job is to handle the technicals. Your job is to dream. Just dream. Share your dreams, share your plans. Just keep dreaming. Tell this to your, to your advisor. His job is to get into markets. That's his job. Don't listen to our mutual fund language. It's too complex. And the last thing is, don't listen to investment guys. Trust your advisor. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot for your time. If I have kind of crossed my limits somewhere, as far as sensitivities are concerned, do pardon me. I'm not taking any political. Um, most welcome. Thank you. If you have any questions that I might try and answer, I can. Yeah, we have one question. Uh, sorry, it's not really a. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was, what I was saying was not really a question. Yeah. Uh, the undertone of your uh, presentation is more kind of, you know, painting a gloomier picture, etc. Yes. So I thought I'll add some positive note to the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry, can <laughs> I, if you, so if you permit me, if you yeah. just permit me, um, I am, I'm not painting a gloomy picture. I'm showing the reality out here. But what I'm also trying to tell you is that. In my opinion, and I am a mutual fund guy, at the end of it, I don't represent anyone. In my opinion, the first steps towards a bus are starting to take place. So when my daughter is 15, when she is 30, she shouldn't have to see that boss is desh mein chhe hazar attack aur ho chuke. I think it will take yeah. 10 years, but we are on the right track. Yeah, oh, so, uh, oh, no, so no. If the facts are so hard, it will be gloomy. If the facts are, so facts hard. are hard, it will be gloomy. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Sorry, all I your. Think, I, I think I think we uh, about facts. Navneet was talking about telling us about action bias, how to interpret facts, etc. So we got to keep that in mind. I just wanted to add three points. Please, sir. Number one is that uh, there are any number of studies which will show you Africa, where I spent quite a bit of time. Right, so I want to quote one from there. Please. In the 70s, at any given time, there were at least 100 plus wars being fought. That's correct, sir. In Africa. That's correct. Right? 
come 2000 they were down to two congo and something like that sure now all that happened because the total system the total world kind of got reorganized but those reasons we can leave on the side the second thing that i want to point out is that all these roads that you talked of what china is doing everybody else is doing that's fine that actually gives you also a road and access yes. because that's what of they were all the time it, it just so happens to pass through our yeah. plans and third thing a very positive from india which a german scholar pointed out to me in 1992 yes which was this that india is the only area in the world which is 50 percent arable Yes. The world average is 10 percent. Which is the point I was trying to make yeah. in the first place. That is why in India, with one third the area of China or US or for that mm -hmm. matter, True, any sir. other area, True. we support a population of 1.2 billion people. No other country could have done that. Yeah. And in Gangetic Plain, you put a four inch plow and drop the damn thing and you get, yes. you get three crops. True. In most part of US, you get one crop a year. And I'd so like to just so add, I, to, sorry, 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 carry on. Yeah, so I was just saying that essentially, uh, these geopolitical things, there was one th another scholar when the world, when this particular 2001, 9-11 took place, he made analysis that there was communism as one set of thought or philosophy or pattern, which started somewhere around 1947. Yeah, same time China and Russia became communist and sure. Stalin killed 5 million people and Mao killed Another right. three, four, five million people. That took 30 years to till unwind. 89 when it kind of collapsed. Sure. And now in 2001, when this Islamist thing has started and the Western world is now opposing it, it's going to take another 40 years before sure. this, is, <laughs> this is also defeated. But I we have a 40 year turmoil. <laughs> uh, here is what your takeaway should be We are blessed to be in this country for two reasons. We are a consumption country. We, are, we, don't depend on we don't depend on exports. We are a consumption-led economy. And in this country, just pure economics, there are only two countries in the world which have access to 30 plus sectors to invest in. The US and India. There are 30 sectors to invest in. So whichever, and the world is in a really troubled spot right now. There's nowhere to invest. In fact, if you invest globally in bonds, you actually get negative yields. It's just weird. This world has never seen investing for losing money. That's how powerful this country is. And the point I'm trying to make is that the reason why this government is wanting to make it secure is such that the FDI comes in. And that's my last point out here. If you get the investor confidence into this country, there's nothing better to invest in. So take a 10-year view, go with your gut, Trust your advisor, share your plans, and stay invested because the ride's going to be fantastic. Yes, ma'am. And I want to ask you how does it make sense to China to invest 50 billion in an area like Baluchistan, which is uh, of supp suppressed people? Secondly, going through the northwest frontier, which is again Taliban infested. And the third is uh, through, you know, Pakistan uh, sure. occupied Kashmir. Sure. So how does it make business sense there? Because they're very bright guys. <laughs> they're, they're extremely bright guys. And I'm going to say something which, I don't know if, if this is recorded or anything, but anyway. Uh, there are 23 provinces in China. Uh, Pakistan's the 24th province of China. <laughs> it is true. It is true. I'm not kidding. They control that country like it is the 24th province and it is an investment and to protect the investment anything would be done look at it the other way around because the risk the risk reward ratios are too high 50 billion is too small it's the 500 billion dollars that matter and and now becoming a global power now becoming another question please do you write a blog? I would love to read. <laughs> <laughs> my my <laughs> wife keeps suggesting that I should start writing, but my colleagues out here say mutual fund be kabi kabi bech diya. So I'm now <laughs> wondering what to do out here. No, that great. I think is Bellwether's problem, not ours. <laughs> <laughs> great, great right. session, Karan. Uh, yeah, fantastic session. One last question. One last question.
corridor. Yes. The first convoy is already. Yes, uh, yes, of course, of course. Done it. Of course. Secondly, they are in negotiation for a pipeline along that road yes. to China. Yes. It will cut even that 2,000 kilometers the cost of it. They, it's, it's the 24th district. Absolutely correct. That is happening. And that is favorable to India as well. Exactly. For the long term. So the only way to cut down the terror issue is to press the jugular. And that's why PM Modi stands on this rampart and says, Balochistan is disputed and Gilgit-Baltistan is mine. That's the only way to push it back. Thank you. Thanks a lot.